Rosetta is all about is trying to understand the origins of our solar system, the planetary system, the sun, that place where we live. How was it made? And the comet that Rosetta is studying, 67P, is leftover material from the birth of the solar system. So by studying the comet, we've been learning more about how the solar system was when it was very young. It was, we think it was a bit quieter, less motion going on, a bit colder, where this particular comet was. So that now has to fit into our picture. Mm -hmm. The other thing which is important is what role comets play in the Earth. So the Earth, when it was very young, was probably very hot and didn't have liquid water or carbon molecules, organic molecules, on the surface. So the question is, where did that st stuff come from? That's what we're made of. Mm -hmm. Now comets have lots of water in them and they have lots of organic molecules and we've been studying both of those things with this comet in great detail. It turns out that the water in this comet is actually quite different to the water on the Earth. You think water's water, but there's a particular tracer in water, a kind of a way of measuring water. Water's H2O, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen. But occasionally you get one deuterium, which is a different kind of hydrogen, plus a hydrogen plus an oxygen, DHO. Mm -hmm. And on Earth, that's always the same value, always the same number. Wherever you go, whichever water you drink, whichever you measure, it's always the same. Mm -hmm. 67P, the comet, has three times more deuterium in its water than we do. So what we now know mm -hmm. is that even though comets have lots of water, probably they only contributed 1% of the water on the Earth at the most, because if you put too much in, you'll have the wrong value of deuterium. So in a way, what we've been trying to do is understand how to put the cake together. The cake, which is the Earth and life, mm -hmm. what are the ingredients in the cupboard? So we've been measuring one ingredient in great detail, comets. Mm -hmm. And we learned that m most of the water from the Earth cannot have come from comets like this. But mm -hmm. this comet also has organi organic molecules mm -hmm. in it and it includes an amino acid, glycine, which is part of the way of building up proteins, and proteins then make DNA. Mm -hmm. It also has phosphorus, and phosphorus is important in DNA. So, and this comet is loaded with that kind of material. So we've been learning again about the ingredients. So I think, you know, that's exactly what we're after. We're trying to work out where the building blocks came from. You have to think back to the early solar system, on the other hand. You know, the, the, the solar system had all this material to begin with. It didn't come from another place. It didn't come from another planetary system outside our own. So it's really about how the early solar system kept those materials, mm -hmm. put them in a deep freeze mm -hmm. until the Earth cooled down, and then brought them in. So in, in some ways, of course, everything we are as extraterrestrial because the planets were built at some point. It's, re it's really about the sequence, the timing. Well, if, if with the remaining few days we have and analysing the data already in the archives, if we were suddenly to find microbes there and uh, actual signs of life which didn't come from the Earth but were already in the solar system when it was young from another star system, then yes. But we've seen nothing like that. So. You know, panspermia, is, it's, it's been one of those weird things that's been around for a long time because until you know how life starts um, on the Earth, you kind of invoke other ways. You say, well, maybe it came from somewhere else, but it doesn't help. You still have to form it somewhere in the first place. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting technical question, but mm -hmm. I think we probably have what we need on the planet to make life here. Mm -hmm. Well, the important thing about eczema, you know, Rosetta's looking for the ingredients of life mm -hmm. which are 4.6 billion years old. Eczema is going to go and look for life today on the red planet. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do that in a number of ways. <clears throat> so the mission which is going there now and arrives on the 19th of October, we're going to put a lander on the surface. It's mostly not for science, it's mostly to test technology. Um, but that is to let us then in 2020 put another lander on the surface which will have a rover on board and that rover will drive around, look for interesting places where there could be life or in the past or maybe, maybe even today, two meters under the surface, buried away from the damaging ultraviolet radiation of space. In between, in, in the mission we have going already, we're going to be flying around Mars with an orbiter 
studying very rare gases in the atmosphere, looking for where they come from, mm -hmm. what, what else is with them, what other gases are in the same places, and how that changes during the Martian year. Mm -hmm. And the key one is methane, mm -hmm. because we know there's methane in the Martian atmosphere, but it should have been destroyed by sunlight. So that means something's making it today. Mm -hmm. There are two basic options. One is geology, deep under the surface, in the presence of warm water, where rocks change from one kind into another, kind of metamorphosis, and that can make methane. And it could be coming up from those places. Mm -hmm. The other option is it's coming from very primitive life forms. Mm -hmm. We have them on the Earth, they're called methanogens, mm -hmm. where methane is a product of a very primitive form of life. So we'll be looking for methane, where it is, and, and what comes out with it. If it comes out with gases that have sulfur in, mm -hmm then it's probably more linked to the geology. If it comes out with other carbon molecules, it could be to do with life. For us, the next step really in Europe is we're building towards what we call sample return. Go to Mars and bring a lot of stuff back. Mm -hmm. And that has two advantages. One, you can send effectively a sterile spacecraft to the surface, bring material back, and you have to keep it sterile all the way and keep it sterile on Earth, and then investigate it with very sophisticated equipment. The minute you send humans there, you know, hum humans are not very sterile. Um, somebody characterized us recently, uh, a well-known uh, space blogger in, in the United States, we're filthy meat bags, right? <laughs> we're just not clean. And so the minute you put l us on Mars, you change the equation, mm -hmm. because if there's other life on Mars, mm -hmm. maybe we'll kill it. I think we have to do it in stages. I think you know, we have to do the full survey, the full investigation. We've got to try to look for life on Mars. There may be places you could go on Mars which are unlikely to have life. Uh, maybe you can send a crewed mission there. But um, for me, I would say we've got to do it the right way. And it, it does worry me a little bit that some of the private enterprises are talking about just going, whatever, right? And we have to answer that question. If there is life on Mars, let's find it first, let's characterize it, or at least rule it out before we go there with human beings. I think you have to look at these things not in opposition. I mean, it's not robotic versus crude. I think we do things together. Um, we have astronauts on the ISS learning about long duration space flight, doing experiments there as well, which are indeed much more effective than doing it with robots. Mm -hmm. And also, we have to be quite honest, the public enjoys astronauts. It's a very human story when an astronaut goes somewhere. We've shown that you can make things very exciting without humans. The Rosetta mission has really grabbed attention, yeah, as, even as robots. But I don't think you, you, you see them as separate in that regard. Um, so I wouldn't say, let's take all money away from human spaceflight and give it to robotic, or, or the other way around. Um, and that's why we need robotic missions first, to go there to characterize before we even think about sending humans there. You know, uh, there's one joke that it's always 30 years in the future, and it has been for 50 years. Uh, when I was a kid and the first landings on the moon occurred um, in the late 60s, we already had books, serious books, telling us we were going to Mars in the, in the, in the uh, 1980s. Um, of course you now have this injection of private capital, or at least private enterprise people like Elon Musk saying SpaceX is going to go there in a few years' time. You've got sort of, you know, slightly more fringe projects, I would say, like Mars One. Um, I don't think it's as easy as we would like it to be, and that's part of the problem here. We want to go as a, as a human race. There's kind of a, a need in some people. We've got to go and do that footstep on the ground, and it's going to be a lot more expensive than they believe. It's going to be a lot harder. It's really hard getting to Mars. And Mars is, you know, we have these lovely pictures of sunsets on Mars, of mountains, of, of valleys. Mars is dead in human terms. There's no atmosphere, there's, there's a little bit of water. Can you get it out? Is it useful water? It's not a place you really want to live. I mean, everybody says, well, this is, you, you're being a doubter. It's just like the people who said Christopher Columbus would never find, you know, but off he went anyway. Well, r the one thing he had in his advantage was that he knew wherever he was going, there was going to be air to breathe mm -hmm. and there was likely to be water. Mm -hmm. So certain basics as human beings, he had, even if he fell off the edge of the map or something, you know. Going to Mars, it's a really, really difficult place to be. Uh, it's just not as easy as Hollywood makes it look. Well, there's sort of two categories. One is, let's go and look for, to follow the water. 
look for places where there's liquid water. And as you say, there are a, a number of moons in the Jupiter system and the Saturn system where there's liquid water deep under the surface, under thick ice crusts. And these oceans are incredibly deep. There's a far more water in these places than on the Earth. And there may even be volcanoes or some kind of uh, heat activity at the bottom of those oceans where you could find life. Um, now, that's important because we know that life on the Earth is water-based, and so let's go and study those moons. It's very difficult, however, to get under the ice. In, on Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn, the water actually comes through cracks, and you can measure it in, in space. Um, so you, you don't necessarily have to dig beneath the surface, but Europa, Ganymede, they've got really thick crusts. Getting under that ice is incredible. It's hundreds of kilometers thick. Mm -hmm. The other option is to go and look somewhere which where the life would be completely different, and that in the solar system is Titan. Uh, Titan has rain, it has rivers, it has lakes, but not with water, with liquid hydrocarbons, methane and ethane. Um, so there's a solvent there, and, and we think that life or, or development and reproduction needs a kind of a solvent of some kind. That would be completely different life to the life we know which is water and carbon based. Mm -hmm. And we've been to Titan. In 2005, we landed the Huygens lander on, on Titan, so we, we know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And one of the things people have been talking a lot about is going and landing a, a little boat or a submarine in the lakes. These lakes are maybe 100 meters deep, full of liquid hydrocarbons, very clear. You can see straight to the bottom of them, we think. Uh, sailing on the oceans of Titan and looking for life, that'd be kind of a cool thing to do as well. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you have to go back to 1995, and we didn't know of uh, definitively another planet around another star. Uh, we'd often, of course, we believed they existed. Why would the solar system be special? But you need that proof. And now we have thousands of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't, you know, the public are aware of this, but that in, in some ways is a huge paradigm shift, mm -hmm. which really does change the way we see the universe. Back, yeah. You know, just those 20, 20 more, just more than 20 years. Of course, the next step is to find planets which are in the right place, perhaps for liquid water. They have to be the right distance from the star they're around so that water can be liquid. But, you know, Mars and Venus, very roughly speaking, are in the right place in our solar system for liquid water. And look at them. One of them has no water on the surface. It's frozen. It's cold. The other one has temperatures of hundreds of degrees and you, with crushing atmosphere. So it, it's step by step. We found the planets. We're finding the properties of the stars. They're going around. We're measuring the distances. We're beginning to measure the atmospheres. We can do that by looking as a, as a, a planet moves in front of its star. Some of the sunlight of that, of the starlight passes through the atmosphere and we can measure that as it comes towards us. So we can actually start measuring what's in the atmosphere. So we're not there yet. We're finding lots of things. We're finding candidates. But in another 20 years, who knows? Maybe we will have found a lot of planets which have signs in their atmospheres that could only come from some form of what we call it, non-equilibrium chemistry, but effectively life. Well, I've never actually thought it was laughable. I mean, we've never spent a lot of money on it. Um, it, it certainly it jumps to the end game and it says, can we find civilizations? There is this whole thing, the Fermi paradox. If, you know, if life is common or civilized life, how come they're not here? And I think we have to also be careful you know, the, the human race is only 200,000 years old, and it's only in the last 100 years or so that we've been able to broadcast our presence throughout, in that way, in a SETI way, through either laser signals or radio signals. So, and, and the planet's 4.5 billion years old. And the other thing we don't know, the experiment we haven't conducted, we're doing it, but we haven't finished the experiment yet, is how long civilized life lasts. We've lasted, you could say, a few thousand years. We might be finished in 100 years' time. You know, it's, it's possible with what we're doing on the planet. We might be gone. And, and that's one of these ironic things that when civilizations get to the point where they're able to broadcast their presence, they also have the technology to kill themselves. And so finding primitive life, I mean, if you looked at the Earth over almost all of its history, there would be no radio signals, but there would be signs of life. I think that's that question. You know, going to SETI, you're reducing your chances enormously because maybe life civilized Radio life only lives for a few hundred years, whereas micro microbial life, trees, for example, as well, they live for billions of years. So it's that. We don't know. We, that experiment, that part about SETI, we don't know. Of course, you can go and look, and we haven't found anything. Mm -hmm. So, 
Well, I, you know, in the same sense that we spend money on lots of things which are not of direct, tangible benefit to people. Um, I think you know, we have to have more than bread and water to live on. We need to dream, we need to think, we need a culture which encourages imagination, encourages spirit. And as much as looking for life elsewhere in the universe is part of that, so is opera. You know, what's the purpose of opera? What's it for, right? I don't know. I think, I, you know, I think the culture aspect, the, you know, the fact that we, the human curiosity is a driver for us is, is, is that. But I think there's something much more concrete than that. And that is that missions like Rosetta, missions like going to Mars, even humans going to Mars, the Apollo landings, they're hugely inspiring to people. They, they engage people. People want to follow these stories, follow these adventures. And people often ask me, you know, what's your aim in talking about ESA's missions? Is it to get more money to have more missions? And I would say, well, not at all. It's actually about grabbing hold of people and saying, you know, this cool stuff only happened because we have people who understand science, technology, engineering, and maths. And those skills are the ones which will save us on the planet Earth. I'm not saying that space scientists will save us. I mean, no, they may be in the clouds. But for every space scientist, there's 100 kids watching the television a thousand people watching what we're doing. And if they look and we explain, this is cool, but it's cool because we're able to use the tools the right way. We don't just make it up. We're really, it's hard work and we're working at it. Maybe we can inspire kids to turn away from wanting to be a football player or a pop star or a lawyer or something and want to become, not a space scientist, that would be nice, but we can't, there's not room for all of them. Come and fix the world. Find out where the problems are. And even, even at a, a higher level, you know, if you, if you have a population that understands that to fly around a comet, two plus two must equal four always, you know, maths isn't forgiving in that way, then maybe you can have the same population hold their politicians to account and say, look, the laws of physics tell me that carbon dioxide is warming the earth up. Stop denying it. Um, and, and maybe we'll have a more rational debate. I think that's a big thing to say from Rosetta to saving the planet, but I mean, that would be my story, is to say if we can gra grab people when they're young and turn their direction a little bit, that would be the, that would be the, the ultimate justification. I think that's a really, really important question. And in a weird way, I'm the wrong person to ask because I think I've already made that decision. You know, I mean, for me, philosophically, it, 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 you know, it's a personal thing, but there is no God. The, the, the universe is a big place. We're a small self-reflective part of it. We are a product of a universe that doesn't really care about us one way or the other. Now, I, it, you know, that's my personal opinion uh, based on my years of experience and what I've observed. But Indeed, you know, what would it say if suddenly you take away this sort of privileged view that we were created, you know, man is created in the image of God. I mean, that's one religion. There are many religions on the earth with similar kinds of stories. Um, what would it mean if there was another life form somewhere else? Now, you could say, well, God is everywhere and he creates life everywhere. But even that diminishes us a bit. And I think that's what we need, you know, a bit of humility and a bit of perspective. Uh, and also realizing that, I mean, we know this we, for, for, for thousands of years. We've exploited animals, we've exploited the finite resources. It's our right. And we're killing ourselves as a consequence, right? So if, if this introduced a little bit of humility and perspective, that would be a wonderful thing. But it is, it is exactly that. It's an enormous philosophical question. Uh, and I, for one, would like to be around when it happens because I'd just love to see what people's reactions would be.